you for, for being with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Soliman. Thank you, Michael, that is in Ottawa, I think, right now. So he's going to appear eventually on the, on the screen. Um, so just to quickly introduce myself, uh, I'm Pauline. I'm the founder and CEO of Artpool. Um, so Michael is there. Now we see him. Uh, and so what, what's Artpool? Just to tell you a bit more uh, about us. Um, we are uh, the first curator-driven NFT marketplace powered by a global network of art professionals. So what does it mean? Um, it means that for the past four years, we built up a social network um, focused on the work of art curators. So art curators have access to kind of a LinkedIn, right? Uh, where they can post about the work uh, they are doing with the artists they work with. They can share their work. They can connect with one another. Um, and one thing that was coming back very often from, you know, the curators and the artists of the network was how can you help with fundraising, with fundings of art projects. Um, and we encountered NFTs uh, at the beginning of last year and started to dig in and we'll, we'll get there and we'll explain as well, you know, uh, not everyone is necessarily familiar with what NFT is, but we'll get there in the conversation so you'll understand better. But we saw it as a tool to uh, raise funds for financing projects mainly in real life, right? And uh, Suleiman, I had the very chance to meet him at the beginning of that endeavor. I think we talked before that for the Art Desk Museum because you came into the platform at that time um, with, with this museum that you have founded. Um, <coughs> and we had really interesting conversation because you were already in blockchain uh, and you were actually one of the first ones to invite me to talk. Um, so I'll let Soliman uh, introduce himself and his work. And Michael, who is with us, Michael Benson, um, who is an artist as well. I've had the chance to meet him through, um, you know, the crypto world. Uh, he was introduced to me by someone we work with, uh, who told me, you really need to look into his work because it's fascinating and it could be really interested, interesting to, you know, explore NFTs with his work. So. We had a very fascinating conversation in a, in a laboratory in, in Montreal. You were in Montreal at the time? No, Ottawa, Ottawa. And, uh, and, and uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's what is our pool. It's, it's those beautiful connections with very incredible people that you know, are open uh, on what we are doing. And I think like we are really trying to support the work that you guys do. So without further ado, we're going to start that talk. Um, so sky is the limit. It's when uh, art and space uh, meet in the crypto space. I think I, I yeah, whatever. <laughs> so we'll talk about art, science, and, and crypto. Um, but if you want to start introducing yeah. your work, yeah, they sure. both prepared a presentation for, for you to dive a little bit more in their work. So. Thank you very much, Pauline, Thank for you. the introduction. Thank you, Matt, for having me here yes. and for the invitation. <laughs> I would have said it at the end anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for coming. I don't know if it is working, actually. Yeah. Oh, it's working, perfect. Uh, uh, uh. No, it's going, it's going fast. Okay, yeah, I think it's better. Can, can, can you put the first one, please? Thank you. So basically, my small introduction, I, I just focus in, in the latest project I did related with crypto and biotechnology in many different ways. I'm quite obsessed about the notion of how we can connect the digital world with the analytical and, and physical uh, stuff. And, be, and basically, I'm, um, and I think that blockchain technologies are a super good tool for really create this connection in between both worlds. Um, and, I'm going to go ahead with, with some, some examples of, of those, those, those artworks. Can, can you go ahead, please? Um, obviously, I'm, as, 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 as you may imagine, I am working with art, technology, and science for almost 20 years. Um, um, my, my practice was focused for, um, sorry, this presentation it was focused on the idea of micro, micro and micro performativity. Um, what means that? That means that my work is uh, several times is creating something like in real time. So it's creating something like a, in an autonomous way. And it's creating data and it's collecting data. And it's, it's some kind of um, um, side or look inside things. Or in the case of Celeste, that is one of the projects that we are going to present. 
it's how the machine, how the technology can look uh, far away you know, in, in many different ways. So how we can actually uh, make a, um, a view in, in, in inside our bodies and how this view can, can, can go outside. So uh, the first project is OLEA. Um, it's a video. Um, basically, OLEA, I'm going, I'm going to show you the video because it's um, self-explanatory. historically related to deities, abundant health, softness, and liquid gold. Olive oil is the perfect place to embrace other natures. Genetic alteration, its artificial construction and coexistence in hybrid spaces configure a new ecosystem of ethical, religious, political, and social thought. That thanks to this project aims to link molecular law with techno-political structures, cryptography, and decentralized models of thought and economy. Alia is an oleic fluid in which the properties of this oil coexist with the molecular synthesis of the code that gives life to a cryptocurrency and blockchain environment. Hybridization of spaces reveals a new place of understanding, a new unexpected future in the revolution of the species. Speculative video, it was the beginning of the Fred Olia. Basically, uh, what we did is we, we create a cryptocurrency, and the smart contract for the cryptocurrency, we save it into DNA. As you may know, it, DNA has. Um, um, the, the potential of saving data because finally it's a code of four elements that you can sequence and you can compare this sequence with a binary code that belongs to a file. So basically the smart contract of my cryptocurrency is now safe into your DNA. We produce it uh, artificially in a laboratory and then we put the, the, the molecules inside the olive oil. And with this action, basically I, I was really achieve the goal of connecting uh, two different economies that for the very beginning was totally separated. That is the agriculture that is the most ancient uh, economy in, uh, in the human, the human earth uh, with the new one that is belonging to, to, the, to, the, to the cryptocurrencies and, and the blockchain. Obviously olive oil is something that was uh, historically connected with uh, in, the, in, in Greece, it was something related with the deities, it was also used as a, as a coin, as a, as a liquid for exchange. So it's very interesting to, to, to dive into, into, into this notion. Can you go, can you go ahead? Um, after that, I play around, it's a video, I play around with different ways of representing the project. Now we are preparing another exhibition for Karachi in October in, by, the, by, by, by the Night Karachi. And this was one of the ways I, I present the project. Uh, actually, you can see the, the olive oil in this spinning sculpture that it's moving the particles of, of, of DNA inside the olive oil. And this, also we have like this um, Petri plate uh, that it's um, connected with those artworks that they are with uh, Peter Manfroni or uh, Duchamp, you know, with the Air, Air, Air de Paris, for example. And obviously you have uh, NFTs because the project is not only in the physical world because the olive oil, but also in the blockchain because, because the cryptocurrency so have an NFTs value. And the other point I would like to, to show you, uh, actually this is the, the, the DNA. How can you actually put like, like can you maybe, I'm not sure everyone is super familiar with smart contract with all of this, yeah. so if we can try to explain. Yeah, um, yeah in, in, any, any kind of, uh, of uh, item that belongs to the, to the blockchain, it could, uh, it, it could be, let's say, uh, registered and organized by the smart contract. The smart contract is the document 
who is uh, giving the the futures the, the futures the giving the the characteristic to the to, to the uh, to the files or to the source of the files. And in this case, for example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin has it is it's a smart contract, and in the, in the smart contract, you can know you actually know how many tokens you have inside uh, the. Uh, so example. here you created a smart contract with all the characteristic, characteristics exactly. uh, of the, the olive oil DNA that you extracted. Uh, actu uh, actually, we put uh, we, uh, we create a smart contract with a uh, first um, initial coin offer of 1,250 tokens. Okay. Then I put it inside the smart contract some hidden content like a, some kind of um, a gift for those who are able to deconstruct the DNA and actually reconstruct the smart contract. Um, basically, is that what that uh, what is uh, included in, uh, in the DNA? Okay. Um, the paid entrance uh, it's also a, a response to to the new ways of representation of humans into the metaverse and into the, uh, the blockchain ecosystems. Um, what you are watching now it's a whole imaginary that I'm going to, I am creating that it's ba based in your DNA. All those elements that you can see in the, in the 3D model are fit by your personal data that, uh, for example, as you may know, um, there are a lot of laboratories around the world, they, they, they can give you like a, some kind of analyze of your, of your DNA and you can extract, for example, uh, your level of excavation, your level of uh, uh, longevity, uh, and many, many different things that are uh, already and actually in our code. So the proposal in, in Intrans is, um, is to propose another way for representing people into the metaverse because uh, historically we were like obsessed of representing ourselves in a, in a real uh, spectral uh, way uh, as, we, as we are in the real world. And it's almost impossible because we are done by atoms um, that are bytes. So basically my proposal is to create some, another <coughs> metaphor for uh, introducing humans into, into the digital space. This is the, 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 the entry movement. Now we are ab about to launch a collection of 1,250 different units. Um, start again, yes. Is a video? No. Um, the, actually, the, the, uh, the NFT is connected with a serum, that it's another NFT that's, that uh, holds your, 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 your DNA data. So you have, you have to make a drag and drop into your 3D structure, and then you can feed the, the NFT with your, with your personal data. I would like to, to say that we are not saving your, your DNA. We are giving people the technology for actually having your, um, and owning your, 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 your sequence of DNA. This is the, the visual code where you can <coughs> actually see what means all those pieces. For example, it's very interesting the happiness quarter where you can see the, your level of endorphin or dopamine or oxytocin or serotonin or so on. It's very, it's very, it's very uh, accuracy you now the, what, what they are uh, able to do with. Uh, with um, and with people the, are doing the test and they're sending you and you are yeah. giving them that and the, and the file. When, when you buy the serum, we, we make a, an order to the laboratory and then in, in two days you receive a, 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 your yeah, place, no. a saliva test. Yeah. You put your saliva, you send them back to, to the laboratory, and the laboratory puts automatically in a, in the database your a JSON file with uh, with the, the levels that we need to, to fit the, um, the and the and you and you want people to be using this as like avatars or exactly you can use it actually as a as, as a personal entity okay so for for metaverses we are in conversation with metaverses for using that the inside. Um, the, the third one, and then I, I'm, I'm going to finish, uh, is the Hardy's Museum. And I'm putting back the Hardy's Museum because it's this kind of project that is like a baby that you create when you are, when you are a, a young artist, let's say, and, and it's following you forever. Um, the Hardy's Museum, it was founded, it was I, I, I did in 2013, and it was um, um, registered in the in patent uh, office in Valencia in 2015 uh, with the idea of isolating digital art files into a hard drive. I was uh, thinking about the, um, the, the importance of the, of the physicality of, uh, of, uh, of the culture, of uh, what's the, what, what means a museum, a contemporary art museum 
in the 21st century when everything is becoming like uh, intangible. I also uh, wrote the, the manifesto intangible at, the, at that moment. And now in the Harris Museum, there are more than 150 artists. And also, we go. Also, uh, this is uh, also is the first museum that is uh, it's uh, saved into DNA because we took all the metadata of the of the disc, and we save it into into DNA as well. This is the process with the uh, genetics Nina Felinski, who uh, she is now coding in Python uh, the, the, the the sequence that uh, belongs that that is uh, translated from from binary code into a sequence of a, C, T, G, that are the elements of the, of the DNA. So Alimon, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I have a question. How does the DNA uh, get replicated and how is it preserved? In what organism is it preserved? Is it passed on for, you know, uh, forever after or, or is it more of an uh, experiment to see if it works for now and then the DNA is just in a Petri dish? It's a good question, but, but, but in, in normal condition, DNA it's almost forever. It's one of the uh, obviously yeah. in the rest. Uh, I mean, we have we have uh, um, pieces of DNA from from, from dinosaurs. So um, uh, in the in the Hardy Museum, uh, we encapsulated the DNA into silica. Silica is some kind of uh, mineral that absorb the 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 DNA. So actually, it's like a, some kind of small stone of silica that it's holding the, the DNA. So once you want to recover the DNA, basically you melt, you, you, you put out the silica, the silica and you get extract the DNA and you can actually reconstruct the, the chain. And then you can, with this chain, you can reconstruct the binary code file. The final is a, it's a zip, it's a zip. So there's no incorporation of this no, information in an organism that then passes it down, like an olive tree, for example. Okay, thank you. Can you go ahead, please? It's a video. That's actually, this is uh, the, the whole data that it was, uh, the metadata of the museum, it's a, it's a representation. It's uh, just uh, to, to visualize how it's going. Can, can you go ahead, please? Um, one more time. Next. Well, and this is this is the uh, this is actually in the, in the right, right side you have the hard disk museum physically the hard drive and in the left side you have the capsule that in, includes the uh, the DNA of the uh, of the metadata of the of the museum. Next, please. Now, Celeste, <laughs> that's now it's part of uh, of the math museum as well. We, we have um, it's a project that is uh, the third version of it. It's, uh, it's all time uh, evolving. And Celeste is talking about how we can um, broke the boundaries, uh, physical boundaries, well, thanks to digital art, thanks to, 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 to a digital platform in a way. So basically, um, uh, we, we create a, a, some kind of beacon like, that, that works like, a, like an eye for watching the sky uh, 24 hours, seven days uh, per week. Um, basically for collecting and creating a big data of uh, pictures from uh, of, of sky pictures. Um, the, the thing is not only collecting those images, but to collect the colors of those images and put it together with the color of, of, of other cities in real time. So Celeste is proposing a new, a new space of connecting, of connection in between different places around the world for talking about the space of the non-frontier. Um, and, and also, I think it's a very interesting in terms of uh, the evolution of the of the of the, the side of the artist, because uh, as you may imagine, for example, in the, the romantic people, artists, they were all the time observing nature, nature, for 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 putting them for putting that this information into a canvas or in, or in whatever kind of expression. And basically, now thanks to technology, we could we could we could cooperate with the machine for co-creating uh, an artwork. This is the first uh, version of the of the beacon. This is in Bogota. Uh, it was very nice to connect Colombia with Spain uh, during the pandemic, for example. Can you go ahead? And this is the second version of the beacon, and this one is the, the one who is installed in the in the roof in in Matt. 
Actually, it has a, already a solar panel as well for, for, for being autonomous. This is the, the, the final model. And this is how the interface looks like. Here you can see the different colors from different cities, and you say, you will say, oh, this, this green color is impossible in the sky. It's because one of the, of the two cities are in, in dark. In the, in, on the night. So when the system is in on the night, the, the system begins to dream and invent some, some different color. But here now, for example, in Paris and in Madrid that we have the same uh, time, you, have, you can see actually the melted colors from those cities in, in just one interface. Um, those axes are pointing the pixels that are collected in real time. And also the, the, the RGB definition of those, those colors. So the, the idea is uh, to create an immersive experience in real time where you can actually uh, feel the, the, the data in a, in a very uh, physical, uh, um, personal perspective. And now... And it's always two cities in dialogue. Exactly. Can you put more cities? Yeah, the idea, in fact, now we are working uh, in the creation of a network, international net, uh, network, and the user will be able just to choose, okay, now I want to connect Madrid with... Staying with the coordinates. Yeah. And in fact, I would like to show you something that no one of you has already seen. And it's, we are also creating our own metaverse of Celeste that uh, is going to be some kind of immersive space, 3D space, where actually the experience that we have in the physical world you could see in, a, in those kind of domes that you can go inside and actually in the dome you will see those skies connected. So now we are working in this, uh, this uh, environment. We, we put some elements for, understand, for a better understanding uh, the project. Um, hopefully in the next couple of months you will, you will enjoy it. Basically the idea is not, it's a metaverse because it's uh, hyper-connected because you can actually enjoy the sky from different places, but you will be all alone because the idea is to create like some kind of mindfulness uh, space for, for meditation or whatever you would, you would like to say. So this is the latest program we are, I'm working with. Um, I would like to give the word to Michael, no? I think. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very insightful. And I think we'll be able to then after maybe, I, I, I have no idea how much you are aware of all these terms and so on, so also do not hesitate to ask I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah, to, to, push me to do it, but uh, sometimes, you know, like there is words and, 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 and uh, you are building your own metaverse, or are you going to work with an existing one? Actually, uh, with the Hardis Museum, we are uh, participating with, in another metaverse. Uh, Which is? The Digital Village. It's going to be okay. launched uh, in, in, normally it's in next month. And we, they did a super good building. I mean, it, the metaphor is still working as a museum, like in the real world, but with a very futuristic architecture. And in this case, we are creating our own, you know, own, uh, our own place. Because we use the word metaverse, but in the end, it doesn't really exist. It's, it's a lot of different metaverses that are built by different people. Maybe you heard of Decentraland, Sandbox, Mona. You are building your own. Um, the goal is that you have one, and you can go from, you know, in all of those ones with, like, your digital identity, um, but we are still at the moment where you have different builders and, uh, and you have some that are more gamey, others are like, like this are extremely highly realistic and, and so yeah, that's very different words. Michael, are you back somewhere? Are you I'm back? here, but um, I guess you can't see me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can't see you yet, but we will. And, By the um, way, um, what, what you just said um, makes me think that actually the metaverse is a multiverse currently, exactly. um, which is yeah. quite interesting. Um, Solomon, thank you so much for the, this presentation, which you know is very provocative and interesting. And and I would like to thank both of you for including me in this. Can you hear me? Thank you. You can hear me. Yeah. We can hear okay, you. fine. Um, Solomon, one thing that really struck me just now is uh, when you're describing this last project where the system begins to dream at night, which I, is such a beautiful idea, that the system dreams at night. It reminds me of a provocative quote by Gaston Bachelard um, uh, from one of his 
one of his books where he said, a very provocative quote, um, where he said, science is born in reverie and it takes many experiments to dispel the mists of the dream. I find that to be a very provocative, beautiful quote because it seems to link science and art. Art is also born in reverie frequently um, and then they diverge, but it takes many experiments. <laughs> You don't hear that that is very annoying <laughs> and um okay i'm getting incoming calls forget about that i will ignore them um anyway i just wanted to put that out there about science born in reverie art is also born in reverie but let me start right away now with my with some of my work so we're going way back to another millennium <laughs> 1995 um my first film called predictions of fire which was a feature-length look at an art movement in slovenia called noia slovenische kunst nsk some of you may know about them they had a theater group rock band called Leibach, visual artist irwin and so forth and it took me four years to make that film it came out in 1990 uh, 1995 it was premiered at the first sarajevo international film festival uh that took place um at the end of the Bosnian War. And speaking of sky being the limit, you might notice that the sky here is filled with warplanes. Unfortunately, some of the themes developed in that film have new relevance today. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, which is actually a film. Okay, if you click on that. So this is the Irwin group and a group of Russian artists, uh, conceptualists, and a couple other people. Seems to be frozen, however. Well, it's jumping around, or maybe it's jumping at my end. Anyway, this is Black Square and Red Square, June 6th, 1992. This is an action I conceived of for my film, Predictions of Fire, in collaboration with the Irwin Group. And we opened a giant Black Square in Red Square, completely without any authorization we thought maybe we would be arrested. Um, anyway, uh, you know, that was one of the core mm, scenes in the film. And um, uh, it sort of made this connection between art, ideology, mass media, which is what I was getting at in the film. So if we could click on that, this is a, another, a, another uh, uh, some other footage I shot, which was Zero Gravity Theater uh, by the Slovenian theater group Nordung in 1999 um, and that was that's a another part of the NSK movement and as you'll see here um, so we were in a, a Ilyushin 76 cosmonaut training aircraft and the Nordung group had developed a theater piece um, in zero gravity uh, this was really one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life I got got to experience six minutes of zero gravity in complete freedom uh, in fact, I was freer than the, the actors who had to perform. <laughs> so that was quite an, uh, quite an experience. Okay, let's go to the next slide because I don't want to take up lots of time. This is Solomon's show. Um, after that, um, I, uh, I began, I was working on another film after Predictions of Fire, which went all over the world and I did quite well with it. And I started using the internet, which at that point, you know, we're talking turn of the century. It was relatively early in the development of the World Wide Web. And I started using it to conduct what amounted to self-directed trajectories of space exploration. Um, I used NASA databases and I began exploring the solar system on my own time in my own way, following what I call the image trajectories of the spacecraft. And I wrote a piece about it, which I'm still quite proud of, which was published in the August 2002 issue of the Atlantic Magazine, A Space in Time, where I meditate on how we have arrived at a time in history when it is possible to do such a thing and what the implications are. And also I, I spoke a bit about uh, the beginnings of AI capability in some of these spacecraft, you know, um, which is quite an interesting theme and continues uh, obviously getting more sophisticated today. So next slide. So as part of that work, I began assembling 
I, I went into the archives of, of spacecraft and I, I started looking at individual spacecraft frames. This is actually a mosaic composite of about 30 individual frames from the Voyager 1 spacecraft taken on March 3rd, 1979. And what you see is a moon of Jupiter Europa on the right and the great red spot on the left, which is a huge storm system that has been raging for hundreds of years. Um, that whole process of data mining and assembling images was part of a project that I was developing of making the argument that the visual legacy of decades of space exploration belonged as much to the arts as science. Again, dispelling the mist of the dream, you can go the other way. You can, you can go back into the dream and, and produce images that stand um, as photographs, as artworks, using the data from these missions, which were acquired for scientific research purposes. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of that particular image, which I could have made in color, but it, it works so well in black and white. Let's go to the next. Next slide. OK, so I think you're you frozen. OK, there. OK, let's go back, actually. I think we jumped a slide because uh, the screen froze here, but it doesn't really matter. We can skip over several images here. This one, th this is Saturn taken, uh, taken by a Cassini spacecraft in 2005, about 18 frames. This shot that we just went back to is uh, Mars taken by Viking Orbiter to February 1980. And these are all composite mosaics assembled from raw image data from the archives. Um, let's go two forward. Okay, and this is um, the volcanic satellite of Jupiter, Io, which has hundreds of volcanoes erupting from it at any given time. You can see a couple uh, volcanic plumes on the, uh, on the horizon there, upper left and upper right. That was taken in 1999 and, and made out of about, in about 35, 40 individual frames. Um, all of that was assembled into a book, my first book, uh, next slide. Um, called Beyond, um, which came out in October 2003. Uh, and Arthur C. Clarke, who I got to know after visiting him in Sri Lanka, Colombo, Sri Lanka, with footage of zero gravity theater to talk to him about <laughs> the arts in zero gravity. Um, he wrote the foreword to Beyond, which was published by Abrams in October 2003 and, and, and did very well. It was a bestseller. It sold, it was, it, there were editions in French, German, Spanish, and Japanese. Um, next. I then did some other books, Far Out, which came out in late 2009, and Planet Fall, uh, Newer Planetary Landscapes 2012. Um, next slide. And I was working all the time. I mean, I'm an image maker and, and, a, and a printer, and I worked in dark rooms at one time um, making my own image, images and so forth. And so I started to print these images. The for me, the test was, do these work as large format limited edition prints, digital chromogenic prints? The answer was yes. And I, have, I had gallery representation in Chelsea, um, Hasted Krautler on West 24th Street. I had a couple uh, gallery shows, 2011, 2013. This is from the second one titled Planet Fall. Next slide. That's another view of that show. Next slide. Michael, can you, can you explain a little bit more about your process? How do you get those images? How do you work with... Um, like, where do you find them and so on, like to give a little bit more sure. of that. Thanks. Well, so it's very technical, but, you know, um, it involves data mining. So you go, there is a, uh, a master archive of interplanetary mission data. It's, it's called um, Global, um, I, I, the name is escaping me at the moment. I haven't dived in there in quite a while. But in any case, it's a NASA maintained site, but it has European Space Agency data as well. You can go in and dig for individual spacecraft frames, most of which are black and white, uh, but taken through different filters. So in order to get color composites, it's necessary to find filters that are within the vis visual spectrum or close to it. Let's say 
you're, if you're really lucky, it's red, green, and blue shots of the same part of the same object, same, same subject, red, green, blue, taken in quick succession, then you can make an RGB composite and modify it. But most of the, I mean, mod, by, when I say modify, I mean optimize it. Um, most of these images are mosaics as well, and that can be done if the spacecraft has been ordered to take multiple shots in neat little rows, uh, which then allow you to assemble a, a, a photographic mosaic uh, like what you see here. Okay, and then and then there's the whole process of getting good, good analog prints because even though they're digital chromogenic, though that's analog paper. And I, I won't bore you with all the details there, but the, the net result is uh, prints that can stand a chance of being understood as belonging to the canon of photography. Um, essentially, I was going into the, you know, scientists go into the archives of those missions looking for their kind of discovery. Uh, let's say it concerns the rings of Saturn, which you can see in shadow on the right there, and also in that distant photo there, um, you know, and, and I, I was going into those archives looking for another type of discovery or revelation, which is aesthetic, more aesthetic in nature. Okay, next slide. So the net result of these books, well, one of the results of these books is I, I had an unexpected uh, um, communication with Terrence Malick, the great director, uh, and he uh, proposed that I work with him to produce uh, sequences for a film that he was working on, um, uh, Tree of Life, which was released in 2011. We could go to the next slide and hit play. So what you're seeing here is some of the sequences I worked on with Terry and his team, and they came from my work, um, some of my books and some of my other work. Um, so Tree of Life was released in 2011. Uh, after many years of delays and delayed release dates and so forth. And the film won Palme d'Or at the 2011 Cannes Festival. And what you're seeing is um, some of it's taken from Hubble data, some of it is taken from planetary images, some of it was Doug Trumbull's work with Terry. That what you're seeing right now is Doug Trumbull's work with Terry. Um, Doug being the great um, visual effects uh, pioneer who also worked on 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, this, this material here came from some CGI work along with data that I presented to Terry and the team. Um, and this is showing the birth of the universe. So that's rather an epic subject. And um, I'm, I'm quite proud of what we achieved. Um, this shot is reminiscent of a shot in 2001 a Space Odyssey, actually. Um, and then the next one, uh, the next one was the first one, I believe, that I supervised at Double Negative in London. Yeah, this and the next one are both from images from Beyond and Planet Fall, um, you know, the, which were books and exhibitions. Okay. Um, actually, let's let it roll for a minute because the next shot in particular yeah, is straight out of um, an image that I uh, have been showing around. Okay, let's go to the next. <laughs> so then, um, uh, starting in 2015, I started working with the Natural History Museum in London uh, to produce a large exhibition called Other World 77 Digital Chromogenic Prints. Um, uh, again, presenting the legacy of visual legacy of space exploration as a chapter in the history of the arts, not just in science. We can go to the next slide. Uh, and, you know, it was the solar system in a gallery. Next slide. Those are all images of the Saturn system. Uh, if you go one further forward, that's me and Brian Eno, the great uh, ambient pioneer, um, who who did a original piece, a music piece, one hour for this show, and it, it, that piece then toured with the show, which was presented in Vienna and Queensland, Australia, and uh, Shanghai, and here in Ottawa as well. Okay, next. Okay, so then a few years before that, actually, this is out of sequence, I produced a book called Cosmographics, 
300 illustrations. Um, and that's a look at uh, thousands of years of attempts to visualize the universe graphically. Um, and it did quite well, and I'm quite proud of it. Next. Um, this is two of my discoveries in researching that book. It's um, fantastic illuminated manuscript paintings by Francesco di Hollande, a Spanish student of Michelangelo. Uh, the original is in the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in Madrid. Uh, it was, these were painted in 1573 and they depict the creation of the universe. On the left, you see the alpha and omega, uh, the, the, the word of God creating the visible universe. And on the right, uh, the celestial spheres have been created and there is God, uh, you know, floating above his creation. Next image. And then these are images of cosmic phenomenon from the 16th century Augsburg Miracles book or Augsburger Wunder, Wunder Zeichenbuch. Um, and, you know, some of these images really, um, really uh, reveal the extent of the knowledge of the time and the extent of the lack of comprehension of the time. And I'm getting towards the end of my presentation now. Um, next image. Then in 2018, uh, I produced, uh, published my first book that was an image-based 400-page examination of the, of the making of the film 2001, A Space Odyssey between 1964 and 60, by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke, um, who I had a chance to speak to at, at length about the film. Um, Simon and Schuster um, also did quite well. And I've also been, next image, And that should play as a film. So I've also done a number of pieces for the New York Times in which I use data from uh, satellites to reveal the impact of climate change. You could click on that again if you like. The impact of climate change uh, on the Earth. And here you see in the northern hemisphere vast uh, vast clouds of smoke from forest fires in the in the western part of the country. Go to the next slide where you'll see it a little closer. Yeah, and click on that too, please. Um, you know, here you see uh, it's ten days of data showing the uh, evolution of these gigantic clouds of smoke from from fires on the in the west coast. In the previous image, you could also see them burning jungle off in uh, South America. So this is an attempt to raise awareness of what we are doing to the planet. All right, let's, let's quickly go through the next few. The next shot is, uh, in the last few years, I've been using the scanning electron microscope at the Canadian Museum of Nature, and I am investigating natural design at sub-millimeter scales. And actually, what you're seeing is bigger than a millimeter. Th those are dragon, Cuban dragonfly wings. And I've been using this same mosaicing um, process to take many, many scans and then stacking them and mosaicing them to produce this kind of image. Next, next slide. This is a Canadian uh, aphid in, surrounded by a Canadian flower, not to be nationalistic about any of this. Um, and go to the next. Okay, and that's a closer view of this. This, this image took me uh, two months of solid work because it is just so many scans and so forth. And, and these are going to be presented in large format in gallery settings. Next slide. That is a silica skeleton of a rate of a diatom, uh, these little miraculous single cell creatures that, that produce between 25 and 50% of all the oxygen we breathe in the atmosphere of the earth is produced by these tiny little creatures with, they have many, many different shapes and forms. And finally, let's just go through, um, you can shuffle through the next few slides, please, um, which are images I'm producing with the intention of dropping them as NFTs. Um, and if you just scroll back and forth with them, you'll see they're all based on geological maps of planets. Um, and uh, what I'm getting at here is uh, a kind of a um, projection of space and time upon these objects and creating abstract works, let's say, uh, from what originates as scientific data sets. 
And those will be uh, also, they're, they're, these are also frames from a film that I will be releasing. This one will be called Lunar Morphologies. And that's, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, well, thank you for, for finishing on, on, on the NFT uh, topics because I yep. think we're gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but um, I think I'm gonna go on that, on that question that um, I'm going to challenge you a little bit, I would say. Um, what I think is interesting is, Michael, we got in touch and, and you haven't done NFTs yet, and, and that's a subject that you're interested by, and Solima is really, I mean, blockchain is core of your work, and you just showed it um, in your work. And um, for the latest projects so around, around the sky, um, NFT, it's, it's a certificate, but it's a way of owning, right? It's owning something that is intangible, um, a digital file. Um, but here, if we push it like the concept, it's owning a piece of the sky, a piece of a planet. A planet. Um, and, and my question is like, why is it interesting to you? Like, why do you think like this, is that just a way of selling work, which could be, and which would be completely understandable or do you see conceptually something that goes even further um michael you heard me right yeah sure i mean yeah. uh, i could take a, i could take a stab at it or solomon if you want to go first i'm sure you have more to say about it since you have done so much work with blockchain okay <clears throat> so ba basically for me um uh, the, the nfts and blockchain technology it's some kind of evolution in the media you know in a way um, and it was something that I was already, I was scared about my production in many different ways because finally an image artist, we are not the owners of nothing. It's like a painter that's painting in a canvas and someone came and just put out the canvas and you are just painting in the air. Because we are not using the servers and we are not the owners. Uh, computers is the only thing that we, we own, but we, when we search the, the information, we put it in, a, in the screen of another one and so on and so far. Um, the, the, uh, it was something that it's uh, already previewed in the industry because finally we don't uh, we, we should not forget that that obviously uh, the NFTs are, are a solution that come from the from the industry. And but the most important thing for me, it's, and we already talked about this, is that that people now understand that their intangibility has a has a value, and that is super important, even for sustainability purposes in the future. Uh, because when you own something, it's also a question of status, social status. And art is connected, and collectors are connected with the, uh, with the social status. But with the NFTs and with the metaverse ecosystems and with the impact of internet, obviously those, this status, social status is bigger than ever. Because you can share your content for a million people. Uh, if you, for example, if you want a Ferrari, if you have a Ferrari, you want to, okay, I want to show my Ferrari, I, I will be able to show it all over my neighborhoods. But if I, I have a, a, an NFT into, into the internet, you, the, your audience is almost unless. So basically, maybe in the future, and I will be, I, I will happy, we will, I will be happy, sorry, if that happens, uh, maybe we decrease our level of consumption in the real world, and we put all those desires of having things, of owning things, into the digital and I think that's very important because maybe we will rest like three things that are the most important ones in our common life connected with humans connected with the with feelings and then we put other things in there yeah, but the, the what's interesting me and, and and that's a really que real question I have because I would buy an NFT of the sky <laughs> but you know like why like um, why do you think like it is important, maybe it's more philosophical in a way, but what do you think it is? It is interesting to propose to collectors and, and, and you know, the fact of owning something you absolutely cannot own. Yeah, absolutely. Know? Yeah, in, in, in fact, uh, art in a way, it's something like that. And, uh, Michael is working uh, in the same direction. Yeah, no? yeah but, but that's why the question is for both of you. Maybe you I think have it's super, uh, super cool because also he's, he, he's already, uh, already talking about in, in his worry about micro, and micro performativity in many different ways, but but, but finally yes, finally uh, me as artist, I, I I I like to offer things that obviously doesn't exist in a way, and you, you put it in the um, on the on the table, and finally uh, I, th I think it's one of the 
keywords of, of the, the contemporary air production is absolutely to do that, materialize something that is not existing before you propose it. And, and thanks to the NFT technologies, now we have like a, another layer of authenticity uh, that is super helpful for, for, for these purposes. You know, I would say, yeah, I would say one thing regarding um, Solomon, if I recall right, you just said you, you just kind of position NFTs as being outside the realm of consumption in a certain way and production and physical object as a positive. Um, one, one of the things that worries me about NFTs and crypto in general is, that, is the carbon footprint of all the energy necessary to produce the backbone. You know, and that, that is an issue that um, really concerns me. It's almost like we've gotten to pure crack cocaine you know, here, I mean, with, with cryptocurrency in the sense that there used to be production and then value associated with production. Now it's just pure production of carbon and manufacturing of a notional, a notional unit of value. So that's on the negative side. On the positive side of NFTs, um, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that they are a major step forward when it comes to artists being able to continue being associated with their work. This is a non-trivial thing. It's a, it's a significant development. So in other words, the, just the very idea that when the work is resold forever and ever, a percentage of that sale goes to the artist. That, no, that's, that's, it's high time for that. Um, and that's one of the beneficial side effects of the whole NFT phenomenon. Um, so I don't know, NFT obviously is going through a really bumpy ride right now. Uh, the NFTs associated um, with art and cryptocurrency, that's, there's nothing else, there's, it's blockchain. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see where things go. One of the aspects of the whole NFT space that I found almost repellent is this gold rush mentality associated with you know, profiting from, short-term profiting from, from the NFTs. On the other hand, I'm not somebody who dismisses the commercial um, imperatives behind culture, po popular culture, and the creativity that can be unleashed due to the profit motive. I mean, I'm not, I'm with Dave Hickey on that, the great um, art critic who died a, a year ago, um, where he, he wrote a lot about the ways in which, um, um, the ways in which the formal art world, the, you know, the official art world tries to put a kind of firewall in between profit and, and the sanctity of art, uh, as opposed to, I don't know, the music industry, popular music, popular culture, where money is such an integral part. Thank you. Good. Yes, I think you are, you are both mentioning something um, very interesting, and, and, and that's directly related to NFTs, is how artists can be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably something we are, you know, in the art world, not talking enough. Um, even in the art market, I mean, it's all underlined, but it's not, uh, you know, we assume that in the end, the artists don't get royalties, um, and 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 that's and they should actually, like mm. by law, they should. Um, so it's true that like NFTs are indeed replying to, to some extent, to this problem, um, and I think that's really important to say it. Like, and and the more we say it, the more um, you know people will get it. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting way to collect digital art, obviously, and, and to collect things that, that were difficult to collect <laughs> and very few collectors were collecting um, because, you know, having a, a, a USB pen or just a file and a certificate is sometimes not enough for people yeah. collecting uh, yeah. photography yeah. and video and so on. But it's really ma making a, an entire new, um, I mean, not so new because you have digital artists for decades, but it's still opening doors to more and more artists who didn't know how to sell and to leave from their, from their digital work. And I'm sure you went through this, both of you, um, that for years it was complicated and that's a reply. So finally, like there is a way, um, you know, to directly own money, uh, I mean, own, be paid for, for the work. Um, what's interesting as well um, is that these smart contracts that Soliman was explaining earlier, um, you can spread the, the fees even if you have several collaborators and that's what we are doing at Artful when we have a project. We spread automatically the fees. So it means that there is not like one person that needs to pay the other and this sometimes can, can be a trouble. 
Um, it's small things, but it's, it's important things because it, in the end, it's, it's how you collaborate and the relationship with one another because we're still selling half, right? Um, and the fact that yes, if you know someone resell and then resell and then resell, so what's crazy in crypto is that you have a, a, an extreme velocity of, of, of resell, not with everything. It's, it's, it's right now with a certain part, but it's easier to resell than mm -hmm. you know, in the physical art world. Mm -hmm. Um, and this means the artist, again, it's something you're going to put in that contract that each time there is a sale, it's automatic, automatically executed. For example, you can get like for us, it's 10% to the artist forever. So it means that finally an artist for a piece they have, you know, sold at the moment in their career, um, that, you know, they could have been emerging artists and sell pretty low, but you know, they did work all that time to make their career you know, grow and their prices grow. So their work at like this very first work was worth way more. So yeah. it's normal that they continue living from it. Um, so I think like it's a, it's it's a, it's something like the economical aspect. Most of the time we look at it and we don't like to talk about it too much. Um, but you know, there is no artist if they are not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to understand. Um, and, and we shouldn't be, uh, you know, scared to say it. And I think like that's part of our mission as well. Um, you know, we've decided to work mainly with curators, who works with nonprofits, um, museums, art centers, artist residencies, because they need funding, you know, and, uh, and the artists are obviously part of that uh, travel <coughs> because that's through their work that also, you know, these places exist. Um, and it's through their work that these places exist only because without them, they don't. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if maybe we can open up the floor and you guys can ask I, questions. I, or I would like that uh, add to another layer of information around NFTs because the NFTs are not only <coughs> proposing, obviously, this, this, this um, solution for, for having owning uh, digital assets, at the same time, they are proposing something very interesting around the artwork of an artist, the, the, the building, the creation of a community. Yes. And that is super mm -hmm. cool. Uh, it's very important around that. And also now we are introducing the word utility in the NFTs. Yeah. So Which is what you are, <coughs> you are proposing, no? Exactly. For example, with Celeste, there is a utility. If you are, if you are owning, you are collecting Celeste in, 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 in the different ways that the piece is going to be produced you have access to this space, you are part of, of an experience, you are part of a whole ecosystem of thinking that I'm proposing to the community. And also you can be connected with other ones that are uh, already uh, enjoying that. And in the, in the very past, you know, the collector was someone who was like a, in secret, you know, it's like I, 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 you have to be in secret all the time. You don't know who is uh, behind the, um, the, you know, the, the wall who is buying your, your, your artworks. And now I think it's, it's, it's more changing. open up, it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we know, in, for me, in a better direction. What, what we, mm. when we say like an, an NFT as a utility, it means that um, you have kind of a, you can create a business logic in mm. that smart contract that, um, I'm going to give you an example. You are like, we have, for example, a, a card for collectors and uh, we, we, we can see that in the wallet of that collector, there is this card. And so they are the only one to access to that specific event or that specific sale. So it's all automatic, right? Um, and and well then it's, it, it can be in the smart contract, but it can also be like this, this person getting that NFT, they will get access to maybe physical things of yours. Um, and, and, and so you can create like, it's, it's all what's behind is all like this, um, well, it's relationship at the end. It's, it's digital, but it's, um, what's behind is people who, want, who are interested by the artist's work, that wants to be more involved, that wants to have access to the artist, which is a, a very good thing, and wants to support. So by buying the piece, well, the artist is obviously gaining something, but he gives back by giving like more to the collectors and the people supporting it, his or her work. Um, so it can be a little bit intense. I don't know if you are in, already a little bit in it, but it's a space that is uh, happening a lot on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, there is this other thing that is uh, called Discord that is normally a more a gaming thing where people talk and, 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 and so on. But you can also think about NFTs like, and, and I think like that's our vision as well mm -hmm. is, is to create your own community. Like who, 
you know, who is um, reflecting to, you know, what you want to put out in this world. And I think like that's, we have heard a lot about this NFT world and, you know, the speculation and, and the board apes and all of those things that you have heard about, but it's just, just the beginning of something that's, you know, going to be in, in everything. Like we are specifically talking about art here, yeah. um, <clears throat> but it's going to be in every field. And, and then it's going to be like, where do you want to belong? And, um, and we are talking like this, this is a way bigger world. So we are talking about NFTs is one thing is how to, to own a digital asset, even if it brings more things, it's, it's what it is. Then you have something that you call the self-sovereign identity, which is basically your digital passport to who you are online. You know, like all these data that today we are collecting on you, eventually one day you will actually, you know, own these data and people will pay you to get access to this, to be pot possibly doing advertising to you. Uh, then there is, you know, crypto that is running this whole thing because what you have is a wallet where you have all these information that belongs to you. So the things you own mm -hmm. and the things about you. Um, and then you have this world that is the, the metaverse. So, and same, like I think we have heard a lot, like, yeah, like we are all gonna end up with like Google and, and, and be in, in these spaces. Um, no, because you know there is there is obviously a new generation that that is more and more into this. But there is also a lot of people that are bringing their expertise, and, and I'm thinking about both of you, uh, you know, all these years of work, and uh, and and are relating it to, to to the real, you know, like what you were doing with with Olea is is really related to something ancestral, mm -hmm. uh, and real and physical. Um, That's so true, yeah. And 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 I think, huh? Sorry to interrupt. No, I, I, I totally agree. And that whole uh, connection with olive oil is uh, fascinating because it's a, it goes to, back to deep, deep time. But but sorry if I interrupted. Go ahead. No, 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 no. no. It, it was just, yeah, it was try to kind of demystify what's, what's happening and to show as well that that's the beginning of something. And, you know, whatever perspective you have on it, um, there is a space for every one of us in it. Um, with, with like your own interest. And I think like um, that's what's really interesting with, with those two beautiful example is there is many different approaches. There is many different reasons where they approach the subject um, and how they embrace it in their work or completely or with Michael, maybe it will be a test and then it, be, it will become like something you're gonna do uh, uh, very often. Like it's, it's um, yeah, I think like uh, that's, I don't know if you both want to add something or we should let I, I, I would add something briefly, which is that for me as an artist, um, you know, uh, I was a filmmaker. I'm now a visual artist and a writer. Okay. There's always a, a, a um, uh, production side and it can be very exasperating that, you know, going from, um, you know, from bits to atoms, let's say. So you're producing physical objects. And then there's the gallery system and showing things in galleries and producing the work and, um, and the same is true actually in film, although film then ends, ends up being something that is um, digitized and so forth. Um, but um, so I found the NFT um, concept liberating in its frictionlessness, if that makes sense. In other words, there was this sense of freedom from producing a work on the screen, working it over, working on it, and then being able to launch it into the world without the intervention of um, brick and mortar institutions. Now I value brick and mortar institutions. I value showing work in galleries, um, you know, uh, and, and a, as I understand it, there's a big show, um, you know, Soliman has a big show at the museum uh, uh, where you're sitting right now. So that should not be diminished, um, but um, there is that freedom produced by that kind of ecosystem. We spend all of our time as it is, I'm speaking personally, okay, looking at a screen, working in that metaverse before we even named it a metaverse or multiverse. <laughs> so, okay, that's what I would say really about NFTs. I would like to get further into it because I imagine that what's happening now is a bit of a culling process due to this crisis that's going on with cryptocurrencies. And um, um, one reason I'm so glad to be associated with art pool is my sense of art pool is that it is a very serious um, uh, attempt to create a kind of institutional frame within this meta metaversal space. Thank you. 
Yeah. Michael, now you are talking about metaverse. Uh, how you envision the the, uh, the uh, register of the metaverse? Because now you are registering the universe from the outside. Now you have to register the metaverse. Like how how you how you are going to do it? <laughs> well, I don't know, but you know, one thing that occurred to me many years ago is that you know we have we have all of these systems, you know, um, telescopes, deep space missions. Uh, uh, terrestrial observatories and they're absorbed, they are taking in vast quantities of data and then creating a, creating a kind of an outside in universe of data. So I was data mining in one part of it, which was planetary science databases, you know. But there's this vast inside out universe being created by all the data and there are far too few scientists to process it, you know. Um, so we're creating a kind of a, a kind of a simulated universe as it is. Um, and then, and then you, we can go into that and make discoveries there. You know, we can make discoveries within our data rather than directly from the universe. And so all of that has a nice resonance with this metaverse concept. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Makes sense. So Lima, do you want to give the last word? Explain where is the beacon? Like how is gonna unfold your project? What outcome? Where can they see it? And thank you. Uh, Matt, for, for everything, for welcoming us today, for welcoming Soliman and the project. So, so basically now uh, we are in the three version of, of Celeste and basically it's now when the project is, uh, is going to, to, have, be, to, to, to be included in the, in the blockchain as well, because in the very beginning it was unconnected. I was already created a, like a ecosystem of screen capture for user for, for having like a like a real time experience and block the, uh, the frame of the sky in, in real time and, and save it and, and, and own it. But obviously now with NFT technology, I think that makes sense a lot to, to really uh, connect the project with this, uh, with this technology is because we are now launching this new version. And also, um, obviously now we are beginning with uh, Lisbon, but uh, we are now work, uh, in conversation with many other places for, for connecting the beacon of Lisbon with, all, with the other, other places around the world. Um, and basically the next step for me is this, to finish this, this metaverse where people could be really enjoy themselves from the isolation of being uh, on internet, but at the same time, hyper connected with the, with the application online. Um, this and you want to talk about the, the, the collections we're gonna do together? Yeah, we are. More, or you prefer to keep the... Uh, we are obviously, we are going to launch um, a collection in, in ARPU. Uh, the, the first one is uh, it's something very particular because as you may imagine, we have tons and tons of images from the sky, from the other, other uh, versions of the, of the project. So now we, we feed uh, an artificial intelligence and now we are creating like a, some kind of time, time lapse of 24 hours, but created by uh, an artificial intelligence. So the idea for, for, for this first collection is to, to have like 44 hours, 24 hours created by artificial And they will have a certain utility in your community. Exactly, the idea is to involve people in the, uh, in the project and then this, um, even the, the, the people who is going to be the first one in, in having the, the, the NFTs, they will be able as well of uh, building the, the, the beacon for introducing uh, your own sky from your place. If you are the owner of a gallery or whatever, you can, you can place the beacon there and you can connect your place with the rest of the beacons around the world. And obviously you will have access in the metaverse. Good, thank you. Is there any question for us? <laughs> so Soliman, yes? Yes. Most artists today have a background in science, a big language in science, and are moving towards art, which is amazing. Uh, I'm still waiting for those doing the reversal. 
So going from park to kayak, it will happen. Why not? It will happen. Yeah. It will happen. But I will start by asking the audience, who are we? What, what is represented in this set of people? Yeah, which I think is really interesting because <laughs> I'm going to say it. I, I really come from the art world and I started to be in more crypto events. And that's what it is. You go to people, you talk, and half a second, you know people, and you know who they are and what they've done, and it never happened really in the art world where you, you don't have that easiness of talking to each other. And I think like if we can give you something, if you are not in this web free space, that's that. And thank you. I think that's beautiful. Like mm -hmm. if you want to just to say like, are you from the art? Are you like here because you were interested by crypto? It's it's nice to hear, you know. But no one's gonna say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer. Lawyer. So interested in NFTs from the low point point of view. Copyright. Copyright. Okay. Yeah. What else? So what else? That's the way we do this in the web three. Artist or, or art uh, management? Okay. What else? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> crypto, crypto. <laughs> Yeah, one thing, one thing that you, you need to know is you don't need to understand really the technology at, at the point you need to understand the use of it. I'm talking about, not us, I'm talking about people who will, you know, interact with this, with blockchain, with NFTs. Uh, there is people building for it to be easier for you to interact with. Maybe it's not there yet and it's way better, way, way better. But it's, it's, you don't need to understand really all the terms. It's, we are trying to because it's difficult to explain. But at the end, like, it's not even necessary because this can scare people in general. And, and it's, at the end, I have no idea how my iPhone works. But I still use it every single day, you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, but it's yeah, it's important to don't see it as a barrier or, you know, look, I'm 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 building a, a a platform like this, but I'm not my lead engineer, right? I have I don't have that faculty. It's not my I have another type of expertise that I bring to the platform, and you rely on building a team to do it, you know, and I, I think like. Michael, could you hear? Uh, I, I, it's hard. It, it, it's a little hard, but maybe you can help interpret the question uh, if, if I can't hear it, but I'll try. That was good of me. I forgot that you would probably not listen to me as good as, a, as the rest of the others. So the question goes out to everybody, but it will probably more, be more interesting to you guys. The one skill set that you do need is uh, human psychology or else you won't survive the space. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, so of all the technical stuff we could be experts on, being an expert on human psychology is something I don't think it's so achievable. How have your personal experiences been thus far as you grow into this way of doing things in the web, in the web free world? Um, in, 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 in. My goal, my goal. Oh, you go first, or I'm, I'm, I got to process okay. this one. I, 
uh, in, 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 my, in my case, I think that uh, naturally uh, my work is, re is responsive in, in, in a way to, to, to some kind of uh, social alteration that comes from technology. For example, in trans project, it's, uh, it's also trying to avoid this uh, malfunction of personality with the overexpose of social media and overexpose of images, for example. Mm -hmm. So and that, is a, that is a response of some kind of alteration in terms of the, the psychology of people and the social revolution that we are now involved in. Um, about Olia, I think it's almost the same. I think it's happening at, at the same time. It's also a, an open door for, for those sectors of the, of the economy that are not involved in technology, that is the agriculture. And the agriculture is the base of our economy, of, of, of us, we have to eat already. So, um, and, and, and this, this kind of uh, base of the economy, base of the society, they are outside of the technology. And now the, the money, the economy, it's in the technology in many different ways. So, I mean, basically I, I, I try to connect both worlds in that, in, in that, uh, that direction, but I think it's very important to, to really listen and, 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 and observe what is happening in the other side with people, because I think that, that now the technology is evolving faster than we are able to, to understand it. And it is because we are not able to know how the, the iPhone is working. I, have, I, I can remember, remember my grandfather when the, the car crashed. He, even he did the, 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 the piece that are broke, you know, manually. He built the pieces. And now we are, we just, the, the, the screen crashed and you, you put the, the phone in um, whatever and so on and so forth. So. We're gonna have to stop, but we can continue this uh, and we can, we can discuss because we have to, but the, the, to leave. The, I mean, sorry. No, my, no because I'm Michael, I'm do you want to I'm reply to that one? But it, you will be the last to reply to a question. Okay, well, you know, I, I don't know if I can live up to that, but I'll try. I mean, you know, one, I'm, I'm reading a book that a friend of mine in New York is writing, and it's all about the early days of, of photography. And it's specifically about uh, stereoscopic images, which were at the birth really at the birth of photography and how that has been kind of ignored by historians of, of image making. And um, he gets into the psychology of it and how um, film was born in a kind of alchemical process, film meaning moving pictures and stereo images and still images, phot photographic processes were, were brought into life by technologists and scientists like William Herschel and many others whose names will be familiar. And so a lot of what we do as artists is reliant on work that was produced by um, technologists uh, and scientists. And then there's this cross-pollination. There's a very complex cross-pollination. The border between technology and science and art is far more permeable than probably most people are aware of. Um, and you know, a lot of it is forging a kind of vision of how we see the world. You know, Werner Heisenberg said, what we see is not nature herself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. That can be applied to the arts as well. Um, so uh, I guess that would be my response to this question about the psychology behind. If I understand right, the question had to do with the psychology behind some of this, you know, the, these efforts, um, which is very profoundly mysterious in a good way, you know. Um, yeah, so that's my probably not particularly coherent answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Any other quick, quick question or? Because I had a, that we could ask one more question. <laughs> Anyone? Ask, ask. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. So Thank you for including me. Ciao. Take care. Ciao. See you in Lisbon. See you in Lisbon. See you. Yes. Bye-bye.